Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jim Wendorf. I'm Executive Director of the National Center for Learning Disabilities, NCLD, <clears throat> and I'm delighted to welcome you uh, to this webinar focused on a newly developed and newly released RTI-based SLD identification toolkit. Uh, we know that we have several hundred people joining us today, and we hope that as a result of this webinar, you will also spread the word about this new resource um, that has been developed to inform identification of students with LD. Joining me today and uh, leading this webinar, we have several distinguished leaders of our partner organizations who worked with us to develop this toolkit. Working with us has been Bill East and his organization, NASDE, National Association of State Directors of Special Education. Welcome, Bill. Also joining us is Luann Purcell, <clears throat> who's the Executive Director of CASE, the Council of Administrators of Special Education, and the Executive Director of NASP, the National Association of School Psychologists, is Susan Gorin. Um, we have a leading parent advocate joining us today, Candice Cortiella, who is President and Director of the Advocacy Institute. And our moderator today, is NCLD's uh, Director of School Transformation, Steve Cookick. I'm going to turn this over to Steve and, and he will take it from here. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Jim. Um, uh, I wanna start with uh, the next slide, please. Um, uh, and uh, I wanna be sure that, that uh, everyone uh, knows uh, the, kind of the order of this, we will be um, uh, working on the introduction to the toolkit first, and I'll do that. Uh, and then uh, Bill East will talk from the state director's perspective, Lou Ann Purcell from the local special education director's perspective, uh, Susan Gorin from the school psychologist's perspective, and last but certainly not least, uh, Candace Cordiella from the parent perspective. And then we'll take questions and answers. So um, uh, let's get started right now with an introduction to the toolkit. And if I could have the next slide, please. Um, this next slide is a, is, is a screenshot uh, that you would see if you were to go uh, on to rtinetwork.org and, and take a look at the, at the toolkit. I want to use this slide to kind of uh, tell you a little bit about how this was done and, um, and then what the product is. Um, uh, we're very, very, very proud of this toolkit because uh, we noticed uh, ever since the IDEA was uh, reauthorized in 2004 that there has been nothing like this done to help districts and states uh, with this kind of practical detail uh, actually navigate uh, the federal regulations related to SLD identification uh, if they are basing their decisions on uh, RTI and MTSS, uh, multi-tier system of supports. So, so what we tried to do was to develop a, a toolkit that would help those districts and states that are really uh, involved with response to intervention. Uh, we used as a resource for this a wonderful piece of work that was done by Joe Kovaleski and Amanda Vander Hayden and, and Ed Shapiro that was called RTI-based uh, LD identification. Uh, and that resource uh, served as the kind of structure for what we were putting together. We gathered uh, a year ago, October, about 40 people who are experts in the field, uh, asked for their opinions and consensus on how to put the toolkit together. We then contracted with uh, four uh, uh, authors to help us make this happen, uh, the lead author being Candace Cordiella, who will speak a little bit later, Steve Goodman from Michigan, who's in charge of, of their um, um, initiative on MTSS called My Blissey, um, and uh, Claudia Rinaldi, who's an expert in English language learners, um, and Sue Gam, uh, who is an expert in special education law, along with Candace Cordiella, were the lead authors. We asked uh, everyone on the round table to be editors as we went, went uh, along in the year. We had great management of this, of this process from Elaine Neifeld on our staff at NCLD. Uh, with that, we developed this toolkit. You can see on the, on the screen in front of you uh, that it has several components um, that follow the, what the federal regulations have to say. Uh, I will say this to everyone who is uh, listening to the webinar and wants to get involved with the toolkit. Uh, this really does follow the way the federal government chooses to define unexpected underachievement 
uh, which is uh, sort of the the phrase that defines specific learning disabilities uh, in the uh, in IDEA, the federal special education law. Um, and what it says is is that first of all, you have to determine that there is achievement uh, below the standard and below what you would expect from the from the student uh, in one of eight different areas. And then you have a choice to make as a school district or a state. Uh, and that choice is, are you going to use RTI as, uh, as, as uh, the foundation for your decisions, not as the only data source, but as the foundation for your decisions? Or are you going to use, um, looking at a pattern of strengths and weaknesses, or are you going to use another research-based procedure? For those districts that choose RTI, then this toolkit is, is the one for you. Um, and so after that choice is made, the next uh, decision uh, to be made is, why is there this underachievement from this student? And I'm in the middle of the, of the infographic now where it says exclusionary factors. Uh, and the way the federal government uh, uh, chose to talk about this, this notion of unexpected underachievement is to say that if the primary reason for the, for the underachievement is not one of the exclusionary factors, those things being sensory impairments, serious emotional disturbance, um, uh, economic disadvantage, environmental disadvantage, cultural factors, um, English being an English language learner, if none of those factors are the primary reason for uh, the problem the child's having, then that child could well be a, a child who might be declared eligible for special education in the, the specific learning disabilities category. Um, of course, another decision that has to be made is, um, is there a need for special education? So not only does the disability exist, but is there a need for special education and related services? Uh, there is one last uh, provision in the in the federal regs that uh, that we included, um, uh, and that I, that is a very important one, um, and that is on the left hand side of the infographic in the in the lower in the lower box that says insufficient progress to adequate instruction. The, 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 the issue of adequate instruction is one that is, that is said in a forthright way in the federal regulations of special ed uh, in, in, in the uh, identification part of the regs. Um, and what it says is that if the child has not had adequate instruction in reading and math, then the child cannot be found to be eligible in any category um, for special education under IDEA. And, and further, it says, um, in regard to the definition of adequate instruction in reading, it refers to a regulation that is not in IDEA, but is in the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, now known as No Child Left Behind. And it refers to a part of the regulations that describes um, uh, what has been called in the past reading first. Uh, the significance of that is, is, is this, um, that that definition of adequate instruction in reading suggest that there are five issues that have to be addressed if you're going to adequately instruct students uh, in reading. Uh, and, and those include phonemic awareness and fluency and, and vocabulary and comprehension. But the fifth is called phonic decoding. So all five of those issues have to be addressed if you're going to uh, meet the provision of the federal regulations related to the issue of adequate instruction. So we included uh, a section that relates to that issue as well. Uh, another part of the toolkit is that we uh, also have um, a section on documentation, and I think um, Luann uh, Purcell is going to talk a bit about that uh, when it's her turn to talk uh, a bit about, uh, about this toolkit from the local director's perspective. Um, and so that's an exciting part of the, of the toolkit uh, as well. One last part of the toolkit that I think is, uh, is important to mention, uh, and that is that there are four case studies that are included with the toolkit from four different states. Uh, from, from Colorado, from Kansas, from Pennsylvania, and from Florida. Uh, those are states that have really moved forward with, with great vigor and with great accomplishment uh, in regard to using RTI as a basis for SLD identification. Uh, I will uh, put in one last little plug, if I may, um, and that is that, that throughout the toolkit, there are hot links to articles and book chapters and, 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 and tables and references um, most of which are on rtinetwork.org. Um, please know and tell your colleagues that the toolkit will be available for them to, uh, to, for them to view uh, on YouTube by the end of tonight and on RTI Network by the end of tomorrow night. And then that, that archive will be there on, on the website. So that's basically the, the toolkit. We're, we're very, very uh, proud to have um, these uh, great sponsoring organizations with NCLD to make this happen. 
uh, and uh, I think we'll just move right on to um, the rest of the agenda, if we may. And uh, I will start then uh, with uh, Bill East, who's the executive director of the National Association of State Directors of Special Ed, who will give the perspective of the State Director of Special Ed. Bill. Thank you, Steve, and hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want you, everyone, everyone <coughs> excuse me, everyone to know how pleased uh, how we are that NASDAQ has been a partner in the development of the toolkit uh, and recognize uh, two of our uh, board members for their participation in the development of the kit, State Director uh, Colleen Riley from Kansas and former State Director uh, Rich Henderson from Idaho. Uh, I'll provide my brief comments related to three areas that I want to address uh, related to the toolkit. The first one being quality, then relevancy and, and <clears throat> excuse me, usefulness. Uh, so let's look at quality. Uh, you know, I believe uh, in looking over the toolkit that uh, the readability, the layout, the formatting is uh, very good. It's, re it's real easy to navigate. Uh, the resources and tools are excellent. I'm particularly impressed with the SLD determination worksheet, and I think that's a valuable two for everyone to use. And the two kit is based on evidence-based evidence research and the critical thinking by recognized experts, both in the development of the two kit and the review. So my thinking is that it is of high quality. Second, let's look at how relevant this two kit is for people that are using it today. Uh, as you know, the context of where we find ourselves changes from time to time, uh, but uh, we must make sure that we are relevant uh, to, to stay in the game. So let's look at relevancy. Uh, I think the toolkit is within the parameters of the current IDA. Now, why is that important? It keeps states and local districts legal. So we can't go out of bounds with the current uh, IDEA uh, law and regulations. Uh, I believe it provides uh, a recommended process with not only flexibility, but it's not seen as a mandate. Remember, we have not created new law or regulations with the toolkit. It is a guide for us to use uh, in our work uh, to, to for those people that are using RTI uh, in their uh, uh, work with uh, determining eligibility, eligibility for SLD. Uh, in looking at all the complexity around this work, uh, I believe uh, uh, it came uh, apparent to me of the importance of higher education's role in teacher preparation and the state and district's role in professional development. Uh, so uh, I believe this this tool, this toolkit will be so valuable in the preparation of the people that are going into work as teachers, administrators, and others uh, in our field. And third, I want to uh, just make a, uh, two or three comments about uh, the toolkit's usefulness. Uh, I found it very useful. I think it's very valuable in helping the stakeholders identify the correct individuals to receive specially designed instruction. You know, I think this is a big question for our field going forward. Just which students should be involved in specially designed instruction and have an IEP in this age when we have greater emphasis on multi-tiered system of supports for all students and the acceptance of online learning uh, as a way to deliver instruction uh, making sure that we have the right students to receive those services along the three tiers of, of MTSSS is very, very important. I also think it's a very valuable resource in helping policymakers uh, work with their stakeholders in the reauthorization of the ESEA and the IDEA. I know I intend to use uh, the toolkit as I work with my board of directors and uh, membership as we developed uh, uh, recommendations for the reauthorization of these two important laws. 
And third, uh, I found the caution section of the toolkit very, very informative. The eight major cautions that are there uh, related to the RTI-based SLD identification process is very important uh, for everyone that is using the toolkit. So, Steve, I uh, will stop there and, and, and so we can go on to Luann. But I felt like the, the, uh, the quality, the relevancy, and the usefulness of the toolkit uh, merits a review by everyone that's interested in the identification of students with SLD. Uh, thank you, Bill, very much. Um, let's turn right to Luann Purcell, who's the Executive Director of the Council of Administrators of Special Education, CASE, who will give the perspective from the local director's perspective. Luann. Thank you, Steve. Uh, and I also want to uh, say how much uh, um, honor uh, it was for CASE to be a part of this partnership uh, and to say a very special thank you to the two uh, members of our executive committee who participated in the roundtable, which was just a part of this whole development process. But at that time, um, our president, Lori Vanderplug from Michigan, who is now our past president, and our policy and legislative um, uh, uh, chair, uh, Phyllis Wolfram from Missouri uh, were the two that were in New York and a part of the development. Um, I think that one of the keys to this toolkit from the local director's perspective is that the local director in many instances was the one whose shoulder everything fell on and now they have a great resource that they can look through. So if we'll go to the next slide, um, we can look at just a couple of things that uh, especially are related to the local director. Um, as I said, the leadership of a local director has been really critical in implementation and, and even beyond that in the fidelity of the implementation. And, and while we know that this is not a special ed, um, RTI is not special ed, but the, the aspect of it with the specific learning disability certainly is special education. So the leadership had to be a, a fine line that, that was walked by our directors. And I think this tool is a very concise, uh, vetted tool that has gone across stakeholders and it's all in one place and they it's, so I think it's going to be a great uh, resource for our directors. <clears throat> it also is uh, one of the big issues for our local directors is the allocation of appropriate resources whether that's actual people, personnel, or whether it, it's money or most often the time that's involved. I think that this toolkit is really going to be helpful in, in all of those areas. Um, it, it helps to identify targeted intentional uh, areas of needed professional development in order to ensure the quality implementation of um, this whole program and, uh, it, and it is different in every state and it's different in every uh, in every district and even schools sometimes so so I think that this is going to give them a, a great toolkit uh, that they can use let's go to the next slide and you know it's often uh, the case that uh, local directors um, have to interpret state policies. Uh, it's one of the reasons why CASE feels so strongly that we need to be strong partners with NASD is uh, state directors and local directors have to work together. Uh, and of course, uh, all of the partnerships that we're involved in um, with the NASP and with uh, NCLD, I think are critical. But local directors do often have to interpret the state uh, policies and to identify how RTI is, is implemented and how it's uh, um, defined. And so I think that this toolkit is going to help with that interpretation. Um, I, I really liked what Bill said about the cautions. You know, it, it really uh, helps both the directors and the state directors in that area. Um, even if um, the local and I apologize for that phone. I, I can't do anything about it right now. Um, it's important for our local directors to monitor and guarantee the continuous improvement is in place and consistency is happening across the area. Um, it's also important for them to monitor eligibility requirements and ensure that, that uh, the, they have data that meets those requirements. Um, it, it's critical in um, Every director has probably developed their own ideas, but if we look at the great tool that uh, comes with the documentation that's on the next slide, um, I think that that's going to make it so much easier for our local directors. 
Um, it, it really shows uh, all of the six areas of the criterion. Of course, you can't read it from the slide, but it gives you the the um, the idea that you have a four page uh, form. And yes, it's another form, but it's not just another form because it's very uh, appropriate. It's, it's been vetted. It's also um, very concise. Uh, it lists all the things that you absolutely need to consider. Um, I think that it is helpful both um, from the special ed perspective, the general ed perspective, and the parent perspective. I think it lays it out very nicely, uh, and it's uniform. And so often we see, even within a state, we'll see district to district developing their own worksheets. And um, while this is not necessarily a requirement, it does make sure that you look at all of the things that are already required. Um, it's not, as Bill said, we haven't, it's not any new law. We're not creating anything. We're just making, putting into one place a very concise vetted form that walks you through the different categories. So I think overall it's going to be a benefit to our local directors to have um, this toolkit as another resource uh, in their bag of tricks. So we're real excited to be a part of this. Uh, thank you, Luann, very much. Um, uh, let's turn right to uh, Susan Gorin who's the executive director of the National Association of School Psychologists, NASP. Uh, Susan, take it away. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I first want to honor uh, the National Center for Learning Disabilities. Um, Jim, Steve, um, Sheldon Horowitz, with Elaine Ifield, and many others. Um, they had the, the foresight and to uh, develop the leadership to um, gather all of these organizations, uh, CASE, NASD, and CLD, and NASP to develop something that is so much needed in the field. Um, personally, you know, with Bill and Luann and Steve, um, we have been, this is not our first rodeo when it, when it comes to special education um, identification and assessment. Um, I came on board at the Council for Exceptional Children back when Gerald Ford was about to sign uh, 94142, which is now IDEA. And again, issues of identification and assessment and we're going to do, how we're going to find out this information about these children, how we're going to use that information has been a major issue in um, all of our work. So this resource fulfills a critical, critical need um, for accurate information on the RTI approach to LD, SLD identification. Um, in terms of the many strengths of the toolkit, um, there, it provides very clear information, as been said, on the legal requirements the criteria for, um, that are specified in the regs, um, as well as how to use the information, the data received from the RTI approach for instructional deci decisions. Um, uh, uh, like the others, what two of my favorite sections, the cautions associated with using the procedures based on those early adapters who have tried the, um, the RTI approach and who have um, you know, found where the soft spots are, and, and we've learned from those soft spots. But really my favorite is the considerations for English language learners, and I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, but their, um, their needs for um, the kind of education and the needs for school psychologists especially to understand um, where their learning strengths and where some deficiencies might be is really important. So, um, also, because school psychologists are really the go-to key members of IE, uh, IEP teams who provide guidance and, um, and know the aspects of RTI, um, they know the legal requirements in IDEA, um, we were very honored to be part of this, and I think this will be a great resource for uh, school psychologists. Uh, we take a lot of calls here at the office, uh, technical assistance calls associated with um, what do I do now? What do I do here? How do I do this? And this toolkit has been terrific. In terms of the role of the school psychologist, um, we're not your mother's school psychologist anymore. Our role has expanded, and um, we're very much um, capable of doing um, all the things that you see on the screen, including working with teachers and families of the students that we serve. Um, we have the expertise in psychological assessment. We have extensive training in the components of RTI, and we use those in all the different ways that you see here. Um, the toolkit can also serve, um, with all of its information and resources, as a reference to the district's 
RTI in conjunction with other procedures. So a more blended approach associated with identification of SLD. Um, one quick um, statement is that we have a practice model that delineates all the different areas in which school psychologists um, play their role and are and receive training. And you can go to our website and learn much more about the NASP uh, practice model. I know that the NASD members have been presented with that. Finally, I'd like to thank our contributors who were very much a part of both the roundtable, the writing, and the development of the toolkit. And they are George Batch, Rachel Brown, Pam, uh, Sam Ortiz, Dan Reshley, Mary Beth Klotz, Joe Kovaleski, Bob Lichtenstein, and Ed Shapiro. So I'll turn it back over to you, Steve. Susan, thanks very much. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to mention to uh, people who are viewing the webinar, there's a trending question about um, where to get the form that Luann talked about. Uh, go to rtinetwork.org and navigate to the toolkit and you will find the form and it can be downloaded right from there. Um, I'd like to turn now to Candace Cordiella uh, to give a very critical perspective about the toolkit. Um, NCLD, as some of you might or might not know, uh, is a parent-run organization. We're very proud of that. We wanted to be sure that the parent perspective was um, uh, integral and, center, and a centerpiece for what this toolkit would be. And uh, graciously, Candace Cordiella uh, agreed to be our, our lead writer for this team of writers. And uh, I want to turn it to Candace to get the parent perspective. Thank you, Candace. Thanks, Steve. As the lead author, I'm going to try not to be very critical because <laughs> I uh, agree with everything that's been said about the usefulness for and the need for for this effort and activity. Um, a couple of uh, brief comments with regard to parents. <clears throat> I think that the, the toolkit provides an easy to follow process that can help parents understand the RTI based SLD identification procedure. And also, we, we, you know, we, we we're sure to highlight areas that can pose difficulties in implementation. I think it's important to always point out, you know, where where things can can go wrong, and um, so that people will have an eye out for those. Secondly, in that documentation piece that you talked about as the last piece of the uh, toolkit, Steve, the federal regulations clearly articulate the information that parents must be provided as part of an RTI-based eligibility process. <clears throat> in um, preparing to write the, uh, the toolkit, I reviewed many, many state um, implementation guides on RTI-based SLD identification. And it, in some cases, um, this role of parents was, was you know, gi given its uh, correct level of importance and in others, you know, maybe not so much. So um, we, we do want to emphasize the role that parents have in this process. And in fact, from my perspective, parent involvement is critical to the effective implementation of an RTI-based identification process. Next slide, please. And to support that belief, we, um, we made a special effort to uh, identify some of the states that have developed RTI materials for parents that we found to be exceptional. Uh, we have uh, three here, Delaware, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Uh, and I would particularly note that Pennsylvania uh, put together a group of stakeholders to develop their, um, their parent materials. And, um, and I think that was a very nice way to go about doing that. Um, for states or districts that don't have their own um, parent and family toolkits or information, uh, I wrote for the National Center for Learning Disabilities several years ago, a parent's guide to response to intervention. I see this guide linked to from lots of uh, district and state departments of education websites, which is gratifying. So um, that's another resource that can be provided to parents either in addition to uh, locally or state developed materials or um, in lieu of if, if those materials haven't been developed by the state or local district. And the, the parent guide is important because it walks parents through a, a um, we have, just as we have a, the, the form on the toolkit, we have a form, a model intervention plan in the parent guide so that parents can see examples of the types of things that they should be receiving from school. So, um, and the uh, parent guide is also available in Spanish, by the way. 
So thank you for um, letting me be a part of this wonderful activity. Well, thank you, Candace, and, and I, I would just reinforce again that the parent guide to RTI that Candace authored for NCLD is available uh, on rtinetwork.org um, under the parent tab on the top. Uh, and um, um, thank you all very much for those uh, uh, very cogent comments about, about the toolkit. Uh, we want to open it up now to all of you who are participating in the, in the webinar around the country. and. Uh, um, we do have a question that was uh, uh, sent to me uh, that I'll start with, and then we can go from there. Um, so the, the first question is this one. Uh, what about states who use strengths and weakness uh, as their model for SLD identification? How will they now uh, be able to use this toolkit? Uh, any of the panelists want to take that, that question? I'll give it a start. Uh, it seems to me that the various sections of the toolkit that have to do with how to look at exclusionary factors, how to look at appropriate instruction, uh, how to look at how students respond to uh, evidence-based interventions, all of that would be very useful for um, any district or state that chooses any of the models uh, for uh, SLD identification. Um, and uh, so uh, please don't, don't, don't turn off the toolkit just because you're in a district or a state that has chosen another way of identifying um, uh, students as eligible for special ed in the SLD category. Um, other, uh, other participants on the panel who want to respond? Okay, um, uh, I have another. Uh, the, the, I, I feel like I'm in the 21st century since I'm uh, using this Skype thing on my computer and I have my uh, cell phone looking at the emails that are coming in. So um, um, uh, that's, that's interesting uh, for me. So here's another, here's another question. Um, uh, how will NASD, uh, Bill, how will NASD use the toolkit in its ESEA and IDEA reauthorization work? Well, thanks for the question, Steve. Uh, you know, the latest uh, word we have here on the policy side is that the, new, the uh, new Congress that will be coming in in January has a great interest in really dealing with the Elementary and Secondary Act in this next year. Uh, that's uh, good, good news for us, but it also means that we need, uh, need to do a lot of work. So over the next year, our uh, NASD Board of Directors and membership will address the reauthorization of both the ESEA and the IDEA. And uh, we just believe the toolkit will be a major resource in developing the recommendations that we have, uh, not only for SLD, but actually the content of the coup toolkit, as you just mentioned uh, uh, just a moment ago, will be important for making recommendations beyond SLD uh, because uh, state directors, for the most part, are committed to the multi-tier systems of support framework uh, as the process to use for all students. So we have a real desire uh, on the part of state directors to get this identification right this time. Uh, we've learned a lot over the years. Uh, the RTI has taken us to the next level, and we just believe this toolkit can be used not only for the reauthorization, but for other purposes as we move forward this year. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, very much. Any of the other panelists want to add anything to that answer? Thanks, Bill. I, here's another one that's come in from one of the participants in the webinar. Uh, this is the first year that my school has had an RTI coordinator position. I was blessed to have been given the opportunity in this position. Does anyone have suggestions as I am working to build our RTI program? And then following that, what are schools doing when outside reports come in with discrepancy statements from outside testing uh, stating a student is eligible for special ed, but these students are performing at grade level and are at tier one in RTI? So uh, this, is a, this is a person who's real dedicated to the notion of RTI and wants some help. Um, uh, any of the panelists, uh, please, uh, please answer. Well, Steve, I'll I'll take the first part of that one uh, to start us to start us off. Uh, you know, I think the if I were new coming in to this work and knew about the RTI Action Network, that's where I would start. And I've I've uh, recommended this many times to people that have asked me, where do I start with all this and understanding. Uh, not only RTI, but, you know, all the uh, 
things to do and not to do and the cautions. Uh, so that's uh, the first part of the question. That's where I would go. Uh, thank you. That, that we, we do obviously believe that that's a great resource as well, and it, it is a really good place to start, and it's a good portal uh, to get to people who have expertise around the country uh, in all aspects of RTI and MTSS. Any other you know, comments? I, you know, I think, uh, now this is Bill again, I think it would be very important also for uh, this person to make sure they understand the context that's, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in their state and in their district to know what uh, to what uh, uh, the district and state are using to identify uh, SLD at this time and how they are uh, utilizing the uh, RTI uh, in the state. So uh, the RTI action network is one thing, uh, touching base with your state and local district leaders to find out uh, the context uh, that they're working in would be the next thing that I would recommend. Makes good sense, Bill. Um, the, in, on the second part of the question that dealt with the notion that if you're faced with um, outside reports that are coming in that says that the student is eligible using discrepancy, um, the IQ achievement discrepancy, I, I'm supposing, uh, and then when the student is uh, being uh, uh, educated in, the, in, the, in, the, in this person's current district, um, the, the student is performing at grade level and is at tier one in RTI, I think the I think from my point of view the the most critical uh, thing to consider here is communication with parents so that the parents understand uh, that just because the student may not be eligible for special education in this new current district that student is still going to be getting support uh, using RTI and uh, using uh, the three tiers of, of intervention that come before uh, special education eligibility so I think that's a I think that's another important part of that and I appreciate the the question. Good luck to you. If we can be helpful, let us know uh, to the person who asked that that question. Um, I'll move on to the next question. This is for Luann Purcell at Case. Uh, if I'm in a state that does not mandate RTI and want to develop my own local policies, is there sample language available to help me develop mine? Well, I appreciate that question, and I think that there are um, uh, lots of places within the toolkit that you can find uh, language that you could use within uh, developing it for yourself. I would also point to another resource, uh, and that would be the Leading by Convening out of the IDA partnership, um, because I think that as you are trying to develop it, it's very important to go across stakeholders and be sure that you uh, build in um, a firm foundation with parents and general ed and special ed. And to do that, you need a framework. And I think that the uh, the leading by convening out of the IA partnership is a great as another great toolkit that you can use. But within the RTI toolkit, there um, there will be plenty of information for you to uh, work on doing it within your district. And I, I think that you always uh, work with any of your professional associations uh, at the state level um, that can be helpful with the district also. Thanks, Luann. That's, that's very helpful. Um, and in fact, I would, I would uh, call your attention specifically to the case studies that are included with the toolkit. Uh, yes. And I can tell you the one that comes to my mind right now is Colorado, um, um, which is a state that, that is a uh, NRTI state, and that's why they're a case study. And they um, have developed uh, some pretty extensive uh, guidelines for the identification of students as eligible for special ed in the SLD category using RTI as the foundation. So you might want to look at that case study on the toolkit. Other uh, panelists uh, want to respond? Steve, I would just add that um, <clears throat> inside the Candace. toolkit, we talked to a, uh, a chart that um, that lays out what we think is a pretty up-to-date status of where each state stands with regard to how they're identifying L LD and their use of RTI. So if um, the questioner might want to look at that um, as we did when we started this journey and look at the states that are, you know, already fully in the throes of a RTI-based SLD identification, and look at some of the stuff that they have developed, which is kind of where I started. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, well said. That's a that is another really great resource in the toolkit. Thank you, Candace. Um, other panelists, uh, Steve, uh, Bill, Bill again. Uh, Luann mentioned the uh, 
leading by convening uh, work uh, part of NASDAQ's IDEA partnership. If anybody is interested in uh, uh, checking on that resource, you can go to uh, nasdaq.org and click on the IDEA partnership and you can uh, get to that leading by convening. It's now uh, downloadable free uh, just by going to the website. Great, thank you. Thank you, Bill, very much. Um, let's go on to another question, this one for Susan Gorin. Um, uh, the, since IQ testing is not a regular element in the RTI-based approach to SLD identification, are school psychologists still needed on IEP teams? Yes. Yeah. Uh, school psychologists do have extensive training in the components of RTI. They are very often and can always be leaders on the IEP team. Their training and their experience allows them to contribute to all aspects of RTI as defined and uh, including let's say managing universal screening progress monitoring planning and evaluating interventions assisting with data analysis and their work and strength with working with parents and families um, though there will be cases where there is a question regarding the student's intellectual capacity their functioning and those instances, the school psychologist will be asked to evaluate the student's cognitive ability, possibly by performing some type of IQ test. So there's a role for all kinds of activities associated with the assessment and the understanding of where that child, um, where their strengths and, and weaknesses are. Back to you, Steve. I think we may have lost Steve temporarily, but we will get him back. This is Jim Wendorf. Uh, we do have some other questions that have come in. Um, and uh, one focuses on professional development and looking specifically at, um, at school districts and what kind of role the, uh, the toolkit could play um, probably in the hands of a director of special education. So Luann, could I pose that question to you? How would you use the toolkit for professional development purposes uh, in school districts? Well, one of the things that I think that uh, a local director could do is, um, uh, and, and I think of course it would be best if you did it in conjunction with um, the curriculum department and, and make it um, more than just special ed, but but certainly to take your staff and go through the, the toolkit, uh, look at the case studies, but look at the, the various sections. I think the, uh, the beginning graphic is a good place to start. Uh, and just maybe break that up into uh, maybe just one hour at a time so that you can have time for it to percolate and introduce an area of the toolkit and then uh, let them explore it. Uh, sometimes we don't let people kind of uh, just explore uh, on the internet themselves and I think this toolkit is one of those things where one thing leads to another and, it, and so do a, like an overview for an hour uh, have some discussion and then uh, let people really let your staff go through and, and play with it a little bit and then come back uh, maybe in a day or two into another hour uh, break it up that way I think it can build some capacity within your staff and and I also think that as you do that that perhaps you would invite some people in who are uh, maybe uh, just beginning on the career ladder maybe t some teachers uh, bring in some parents and and just have those perspectives as you go through the toolkit itself and I think that that can uh, lead to a very rich kind of professional development opportunity great thank you would anyone like to add to that uh, Susan or Bill or Candace? And I'm on again, Jim. Oh, good. Steve is back with us. Good. So over to you. Uh, uh, so I would just, I would just ask if uh, anyone wanted to add to the, to that conversation um, that that just, just ended. Okay. Um, let me see. I think there is another question from one of the participants. Good. Um, Steve, one question that uh, has come in to us, and yes. in fact, it's um, not just a recent one, but I, I would call it a kind of a persistent question. 
um, over the last several years as, as RTI took hold and spread across the country and being used uh, certainly for SLD identification purposes, uh, but also of course as, a, as a, a key component of a broader MTSS system. And that's the issue of um, both parent involvement, uh, parent participation in the process. And I'm, uh, the, so the question is really uh, about the, you know, what is the parent's role uh, either, you know, that the toolkit addresses um, what, uh, what difference would the toolkit make to parents as they work um, on behalf of their child uh, and working with a school? And so that one's uh, directed at Candace. Okay, um, I, you know, I think it's important to point out that uh, parents are really a secondary audience for the toolkit, which was mm -hmm. why I made a point of talking about the parent's guide to RTI or state uh, developed materials that have been specifically designed to for parents and laid out their, the role that they should play. Um, you know, my belief is that um, the earlier you involve parents, the better off you're going to be from a school's perspective because uh, the, the more the more parent is involved, the less likely they are to be critical of the process and 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 in, instead want to be a part of the process. Um, and I have been uh, talking with a lot of parents recently and doing webinars about um, challenges that <clears throat> RTI-based systems uh, pose for parents and some of the alternative uh, strategies that parents can take in those situations. But uh, the message that we've been delivering is that parents need to give RTI a chance um, as opposed to you know, wa wanting, demanding idea eligibility and those kinds of things. And Jim, as you well know, that's part of the reason why we write the State of LD report is to kind of point out to parents um, what's happening with, with youngsters in the LD category who are being served under IDEA. Um, parents need to be aware of those outcomes as well before they um, decide exactly what, what demands they want to put on the schools. So um, I would point people to, to the parent guide as opposed to the toolkit for that kind of guidance. Good. Thank you. Makes sense. Yeah. Anybody else want to respond? Uh, Jim, when I was off there a minute ago, did you get to the, the questions that had to do with uh, psychological processing disorder? Uh, no, we did not. We, okay. um, we so, talked about uh, professional development, and Luann took that question, but we did not move on to cognitive processing. Okay. Right. Right. So here are three questions coming from participants to the webinar, um, uh, and we have 10 minutes. Um, num number one, how can RTI clearly delineate a, quote, psychological processing disorder, unquote? I'll start, if no one else will. There's two issues about, about this that I think are really important. Uh, read the cognitive processing part of the toolkit, uh, please, uh, participants, and you'll, you'll get a sense of the way we, we chose to handle that issue. That's a very important issue um, uh, for uh, all of us who are involved with trying to figure out this mystery called uh, SLD. Um, the, the federal regulations are very clear about what it says about uh, the use of cognitive processing uh, assessment, um, uh, and uh, uh, it, the regs say in a question and answer that, that the, this assessment is neither necessary nor sufficient. And then we said beyond that two things. One thing is that when you choose RTI um, as a district, uh, you are not choosing the other two possibilities, looking at a pattern of strengths and weaknesses or another research-based approach, number one. Number two, we believe very strongly that um, cognitive processing needs to be assessed in relationship to instructional planning, IEP planning, et cetera. And with that in mind, uh, we are uh, in the process of working out the details to continue <coughs> a roundtable this year to look at that very issue about the use of cognitive processing assessment for instructional planning and uh, we will be using the same process that we used here and uh, getting a round table together contracting with lead writers and then developing a toolkit that we hope will be useful for folks uh, in about a year or so 
So I know that that's true from the NCLD perspective. Other, other organizations or other comments? We'll move on to the next question from a different, a different participant. Is best practice considered? Uh, RTI should be utilized in collaborating with information derived also from a comprehensive evaluation. Uh, that may um, or may not include uh, a cognitive processing assessment to determine SLD. So um, uh, the question is, how, do, how, how is RTI used in collaborating with other information that's derived from a comprehensive evaluation? Um, I, I'll, I'll be happy to respond first again, um, but I'll, I'll say this, that, um, that when there is a question about an exclusionary factor, then uh, all kinds of assessments should be used, including an IQ test, if there is a question that it's perhaps true that the primary reason for um, the underachievement uh, has to do with intellectual disability. And if that's true, very often, the only way to uh, take a look at to see whether or not that is the primary reason is to give an IQ test and also an adaptive behavior instrument um, that will allow you to see whether or not this student would be better placed uh, in special education under that category. Um, so um, that's the way I think um, uh, uh, the, uh, the comprehensive evaluation comes into play and other issues beyond RTII comes into play. Uh, but in this toolkit, we're suggesting, given the federal regulation that's that suggests that states cannot require the use of IQ achievement discrepancy and in its place, districts can use a process that takes a look at how students respond to scientifically based interventions. Um, what we're saying is, is that uh, RTI uh, offers uh, this wonderful possibility uh, to look in an instructionally relevant way uh, at the way students respond to evidence-based interventions and let that be uh, a vehicle to let you know uh, whether or not the student is responsive to these evidence-based interventions when they are implemented with fidelity. And when the student is not responsive, then the rest of the comprehensive evaluation kicks in. Other comments? Yeah, um, um, oh, I, I have to echo to you. Go ahead. Go ahead, Candace. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, well, um, I would just underscore what you said about the uh, different... Um, <laughs> evaluations or assessments that attach to what you do the exclusionary um, factor. And in fact, um, as you well recall, we had lots of discussion about the exclusionary factors themselves through the course of the development of the toolkit. In particular, because we really wanted to emphasize how important this step is and that it shouldn't be uh, just a check yes or no thing, uh, which we process, you know, which we've seen develop over the years. It's really, really important, particularly as Susan alluded to, the, um, the, the real hard nut to crack um, is this issue of um, English language learners. And I think by working with folks on the development of that piece of this, I developed a new appreciation of how difficult that piece is. And when you put that in, into the context of this being our fastest growing student demographic, it, it becomes terribly important. So, um, e excellent. So, so um, Luann, did you have a comment to make as well? No, I think that was Susan that was going to speak. Oh, Susan, I'm sorry, Susan. I just wanted to compliment you. You covered it very well. As a school psychologist yourself, Steve, um, <laughs> you you have all the lingo. Um, I, I'm not a school psychologist, but I was going to call a friend, Mary Beth Klotz was here, um, but I think you did a great job. Thank you. Well, m my pleasure. And I, and I, I do want to reinforce uh, something that Susan talked about earlier. Um, I, in the Greenville school district in South Carolina, I met with all of their school psychologists, uh, for a day, uh, of in-service and, uh, we used the NASP, um, model for school psychology practice as the basis of that conversation and it worked very well. So congratulations. Um, so that, I'll go to the third question uh, that was asked by a participant. Uh, how does RTI fit uh, with the slow learners that are performing low, but at a level expected based on their cognitive ability? So uh, I, 
uh, let me ask if any of the uh, plan panel members want to answer that question. How does RTI fit with slow learners that are performing low, but at a level expected based on their cognitive ability? Well, uh, here, here's, the, here's something that I'll start with. What is, what is wonderful about RTI when it is implemented correctly and with fidelity uh, is that these are the very students who get help that is responsive to their needs uh, much faster uh, than in past models where students had to be, uh, if I may put it this way in a medical sense, sick enough to be able to get a discrepancy between their ability and their achievement. Uh, and so when RTI works well, students get service much more quickly. Uh, one, of our, uh, pan, uh, one of our roundtable participants, Jack Fletcher from the University of Houston, says this best. Would it be really scandalous if we provided service before identification? Um, and he, he said that with a smile on his face, of course, because it wouldn't be scandalous. It would be wonderful, especially <clears throat> for these students. Uh, we have about one more minute, and I, I'm wondering if maybe we could uh, maybe um, cl uh, close the, uh, the webinar. Um, uh, any any uh, last comments? Uh, I want to give uh, uh, Jim Wendorf a chance to uh, um, uh, mm -hmm. say something at the very end of this uh, as the executive director of NCLD. Any other comments from the other panelists? Well, I think this all of Luanne. Yeah, go ahead, Luann. Uh, this is Luann, and I just wanted to say that I, I think that uh, anything that really benefits students, and we're talking about all students, um, starts with a, a team and with collaboration. And just as this toolkit started with the, certainly the leadership of NCLD, but then the partnership of so many other folks, not just the four partners, but uh, lots of other uh, partnerships, um, that at the school and even in the classroom, it, it, if our children are going to benefit, it, it's always going to be from a team effort. <laughs> Well, I, I, uh, I, I appreciate that comment, and I, I just uh, want to tell you all how much I appreciate, again, the partnership. And, uh, and Candace, thank mm -hmm. you so much for uh, your extended time and, and helping us to be our lead author for this. Um, I have been privileged to be involved with uh, all of these organizations and, uh, um, uh, for a really long time, and um, I, I know how much these organizations mean to our field, to children and, and their parents. Um, and so, Jim, I turn it to you uh, to close the webinar. Well, very quickly, Steve, thanks uh, for what you've done today, but also <clears throat> for your leadership um, that you provided on the whole process from uh, the creation of the idea right to the, the final product. So thank you for that. And Luann, your comment about collaboration is spot on. Uh, we would not be here today without um, the spirit and the, you know, the reality of collaboration among all the partners. So thank you to our partners at, um, at the organizations represented here. The last thing I would just add is that uh, we believe this is the largest uh, uh, webinar, uh, the most hotly attended webinar that we have conducted. Uh, we've had nearly a thousand people who have joined us today and since this is uh, archived, will be archived on the RTI Action Network site, uh, we expect that um, word of mouth and everyone's efforts will make sure that many thousands more take advantage of it and actually use the toolkit. It is free, it's downloadable, it's there for the benefit of everyone who's serving kids who struggle. So thanks so much.